Okay, thank you. And welcome everybody to the Think Ahead Lunch and Learn today. Our, we'll be discussing the codes of practice for advanced healthcare directives. My name is Valerie Smith. I'm public engagement lead with Irish Hospice Foundation. And I lead on our advanced care planning program, Think Ahead. If you're not familiar with Irish Hospice Foundation, just to give you a little context of what we do, uh, you know, our goal is that all in Ireland grieve and die well wherever the place. And to that end, we have a number of programs and we work across systems uh, in education, advocacy and systems buildings, systems building to uh, uh, create a good end of life and bereavement system for all. So we have a number of programs in nursing homes, in hospitals. Uh, we run an MSC in, in bereavement and loss. Um, and of course, our advanced care planning program, but we also have arts and creativity for death, dying and bereavement. We run just a number of programs. And so if you're not familiar with the work we do, please check us out and see um, kind of all the different programs that we have running that might be beneficial to you in your work today. And of course, as I mentioned, I run Think Ahead, which is our advanced care planning program. Um, and you know, bi-monthly, we kind of put together these lunch and learning sessions on different topics around advanced care planning. For today, uh, I have a few goals for us. I do want us to be able to understand um, how to find and refer to the codes of practice. Uh, how we can become familiar, you know, just becoming familiar with common terminology used in those codes of practice, uh, that you understand the basics of advanced healthcare directives according to those codes, uh, and that you are able to, you know, even get a bit of guidance today in how to apply those codes of practice to your work. So this is really an introductory section session to the codes of practice. Um, and if there are things that aren't covered here, questions that come up, you know, that'll inform future trainings that we're able to provide as well. <clears throat> Out of scope today, um, capacity will only touch on it, uh, complaints um, and other types of uh, decision making. We're not going fully into depth on those, but I'll point you in the right direction where you can find more information about that. To start with, uh, if you haven't seen the Decision Support Service website or if you're not familiar with them yet, please do uh, uh, use them as a great resource under decisionsupportservice.ie, resources, codes of practice. This is where you find all 13 codes of practice kind of plus the, the glossary and things like that there. They're very, very, very easy to read. So what we've developed today really draws from these along with kind of the, the knowledge that we already have as well. But just so you're aware, what we're pulling from for today's session are the, you know, the glossary. So we're really familiar with the terms. There's a lot of jargon that's used in, in these codes. Uh, the code of practice for designated healthcare representatives, the code of practice for healthcare professionals, and it might be hard to see, but down there at the bottom is the code of practice for advanced healthcare, advanced healthcare directives for healthcare professionals. So they're a little wordy, but I can pull from these um, uh, to guide today's session. So anything that's in here, you'll be able to find in these codes as well. And they're, like I said, they're very, very, very easy to read um, and, and really well written. So hopefully they do provide support for you and your work as well. So we'll begin with just a bit of terminology. Um, and after that, I'm, I will go into advanced healthcare directives, a, sort of a, a starter intro session on it, because so much of how the codes will actually work in practice, really, uh, you need to have the basic of, of what's included in those. Uh, but we'll start here with just a few common terms. The ADMA, which I don't refer to much in this uh, in this presentation, but the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. Obviously, this does a lot of things, which we're not covering all of them today. Um, but it does legislate and, and fully legalize advanced healthcare directives, and so that's uh, kind of the the law that this is uh, this falls under. The Decision Support Service uh, was established by the Act. It is based within the Mental Health Commission. They review, they register, they supervise all types of decision support agreements. As I said, I'm not getting into all of those types. We'll just be covering one of them today. Um, and that's kind of how they define themselves. But I would just like to point out again that they're a great teaching and guidance role at this time in this moment for uh, awareness on, on how this law is changing and providing lots of resources to support you in the work that you do. And the codes of practice, you know, they are these written rules defining how we use these codes in our day-to-day -day life. Really, they're easy to read versions of the law. So you can you can read the legislation. I tried, I don't recommend it. Um, 
legislation is hard to read, but the codes are really simple and easy to follow. All of this matters because right now we're moving with what the ADMA sets out is a move from uh, healthcare based on best interest of a patient toward their known will and preference. Uh, the ADMA doesn't mention best interest once, but it mentions known will and preferences over and over. So whereas uh, previously, we would always sort of act in life saving measures. We would always uh, uh, do what we think is best case or best interest of the patient. Now we need to take into account um, and really prioritize what the patient wants for themselves as well. So th their will and preferences, uh, you know, incorporates their values, their personal beliefs, their goals, and their preference for one choice or one option over the other. The capacity, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it is an important concept and uh, lots of resources out there for you from, diff uh, I'll have a few other resources at the end as well from the HSC and from the Decision Support Service. But what this comes down to is a person's ability to make a decision in the moment relative to the decision that's needed. And with this understanding that capacity can change over time. So somebody might have capacity to make that same decision in the morning, but not in the afternoon, or they might have the capacity to make certain decisions and not others. Um, so it's really, there's no need to rush out and, and do a bunch of capacity assessments or anything like that. It's really learning um, and shifting our judgment to is a person able right now to make capacity? Do they need a bit of support to make that um, and, and those big shifts? So again, I'm sure most people on this call are familiar with that, with functional assessments of capacity. And, and if not, again, I direct you to the Decision Support Services and the HSC for, for more training on that. There are four skills to judge capacity uh, or four skills that a person would have to be considered having capacity. And these are to understand the choices uh, uh, in front of them, to be able to weigh those choices, to choose one, to make a decision, and then to you know express or explain that choice. It's really more express than, than necessarily explain that choice, but to understand, to weigh them out, to choose one, and to express that decision. And so that's what we're referring to today when we're using this term capacity. Can they kind of do those four things? An advanced healthcare directive is a written or recorded document. This can be written uh, by hand. It can be typed on the computer. It can be recorded in video or voice format. It can use speech language technology. Any of these are considered a, a valid document. They do recommend that anything that is video or voice recorded be transcribed so that it can be signed as well. Uh, um, but the language doesn't require that, but it is recommended. Uh, and, and advanced healthcare directives detail your healthcare decisions and your healthcare preferences. Both are included within a directive. And these are made while a person has capacity to be used at a time when they lack capacity. And so again, to make that decision or to express that decision. So they make it while they having capacity for a later date if lacking capacity. They are legally binding or legally valid, however you'd like to phrase that in most cases. And I'll go into, into those exceptions. Uh, and again, it's coming back to that person at the center of the care uh, for all ages and all stages of their life. Few questions on... Uh, the validity and, uh, and and different questions that come up around uh, advanced healthcare directives. Is it valid if it's made outside of Ireland? Uh, yes, it is. It must conform kind of with the basic structure or the basic tenets of the law here. Um, and it may need to be translated, but that's perfectly acceptable as well. The treatments must follow Irish law. Um, and we will update this is on my to-do list to update um, countries on the website that also accept our advanced healthcare directives where they are as well. So generally, if somebody is coming to you and they've made an advanced healthcare directive, say in America or in Canada and they or in the UK, and they bring it here, as long as it kind of generally meets the same structure, um, uh, then it is uh, fully legal here as well. Is it valid if it's made in another language? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so 
there's a few directions, guidance on, on who should translate these, you know, primarily being, uh, and I'm going to find these terms in a second, but the directive maker, the person making the directive, um, alternatively, the designated healthcare representative, I'll define who those are, they would be kind of the primary people that would have this uh, obligation to uh, translate um, if it's written in another language. Uh, but if it isn't translated, prior to coming on to your site where you're working, then it would follow the same protocol uh, for translation that you would normally use for any documents on your site. Uh, so again, these do not have to be written in English or Irish, um, but they are recommended to be translated uh, uh, ideally by the person making them themselves. But if not, then you have that uh, right and responsibility to do, that, to do so as well, to make all kind of best uh, best steps to do so. Um, and this is my favorite one. How legal is it? It is very, very, very legal. This is a very legal document. Um, it is as though the person were sitting right in front of you stating what their uh, decisions were in the moment with their own with their own voice or means of communication. So you can sit you could picture this document that you have in front of you uh, as the person's own face kind of expressing their wishes to you right at the same time um, with, you know, assuming that they have capacity to do so. So it's a very legal document. It is the person's own voice carried through all stages of their life, even into those stages where they can't express that in the moment. The directive maker is the person who's making the directive. They have to be over the age of 18. Um, and this, I think at this point here, having capacity uh, is one that I've been looking into a lot because this idea of capacity as it's changing means that you have capacity, even if it means you need support or assistance in making a decision or in having those uh, options explained to you. So if a person needs support to make this document, that that's within capacity, um, but they must, all of their decisions and their preferences must be their own. So if somebody needs help to read a document to kind of explain what their options are, that's all pretty normal with um, a lot of these decisions that might uh, they might be making but their final decisions and their preferences must be their own uh, and, and they are not allowed to sort of be coerced into signing something that they didn't write or uh, that, they, that they don't wish to sign. So the next few slides will just be a really brief introduction into advanced healthcare directives. If you've been to my presentations or presentations by you know, any of our partners, you'll be familiar with this and that's great. I want everybody to be very, very, very familiar with this. So um, you know, test, quiz yourself as we go along if you, are, if, if you really know this well already. So within an advanced healthcare directive, you can do three different things. You can refuse treatments. You can request treatments and, and the language in the codes of practice, I think does an excellent job of shifting this to sort of consent. It's a much easier term for people to understand, but we'll use both. Uh, so you can refuse treatments, request or consent to treatments, and then you can appoint or nominate somebody to speak and act on your behalf for medical decisions. You sign it and it's witnessed and then it's a, a legally binding document or a legally valid document. Within refusals of treatment, uh, pretty much everything under the sun counts as treatment. Therapeutic, preventative, diagnostic, palliative emergency med medicine, all of these uh, potential treatments uh, can be refused or consented to as well um, um, within these advanced healthcare directives. It can be physical health. It can also be mental health. A person can have one document uh, for physical uh, treatments and another document for mental health treatments, or they could include them both in the same document. Uh, this includes up to and including life-sustaining treatments. And so a few examples that I have there would be that, you know, do not attempt resuscitation orders can be included. They could specify ones that they, you know, would or would not want. Uh, nutrition and hydration methods, uh, ventilation, all of these are, 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 are often common enough, I suppose, at the end of life or options that are available to people. And those can certainly be uh, refused or consented to in an advanced healthcare directive. So life-sustaining treatment, um, you know, any, any treatment that would forestall the moment of death. So, we, you know, it's a broad statement there, but it is really getting down into those, uh, the very end of life care generally there. But uh, it isn't only limited to life-sustaining treatments. So, uh, you know, treatments such as chemotherapy, 
surgery, antibiotics and medication are included in this. So if you know, for example, or that a patient doesn't agree well to a certain medication or, or they're ready to stop all treatments that can include antibiotics, even uh, dialysis, blood samples, biopsies, and many more. Any treatment that a, that a person would um, in normal circumstances, while they have capacity to be able to give consent to or refuse, they're allowed to also give consent and refuse in an advanced healthcare directive. It must specify the conditions um, of the refusal and if they're refusing, even if their life is at risk. So I have a couple of examples here and I'm just phrasing them as, uh, oh, sorry, this one is just straight refusal. So, um, you know, I'm living, if I'm living with dementia and develop cancer, I would refuse chemotherapy, even if treatment could prolong or save my life. So in this case, you know, it specifies kind of a time, a, a, a potential illness that one might be living with and under those circumstances, then kind of refusing a certain treatment you know, even if life is at risk. So, but if this person is not living with dementia, then this refusal isn't valid because it's, it's only valid for this specific condition. Another example, uh, you know, refusing life-sustaining treatments and resuscitation methods if heart fails during surgery. So outside of surgery, life-sustaining methods could still be undertaken if needed. This is very specific to uh, going into surgery, for example. So um, because these documents can be made fairly quickly um, and at the last minute if needed, this document could be made uh, uh, before entering into surgery, for example, or knowing that there might be surgery on the horizon. Um, here we have one that says, uh, you know, I would refuse dialysis under all circumstances, even if that would result in my death. And so the, the conditions here are under all circumstances. And so this is a broad kind of statement. And I will get into, uh, you know, in a moment about how changing our mind and, and still being able to express things. So as a reminder, all of these refusals um, are only turned to and looked at if a person doesn't have capacity to actually make that decision in the moment or actually express that decision under those circumstances, then these documents are referred to. The next thing is consenting to treatment. And so, you know, with the advice of a healthcare team, I actually recommend the advice of the healthcare team for refusals as well. Uh, a patient may request treatment. And, and as I said, you know, the codes of practice rephrase this as consent. Uh, the law is written as request. Um, and so that's how we have, you know, our documents refer to it as a request, um, but I think it's a, a great um, a step in, in terms of communication to use the language of consent in advance of need. Uh, it's much easier for patients, I think, to understand that, you know, if, it, if an option is available, do I give consent to that rather than saying, you know, well, why wouldn't my requests be honored? So uh, requests are not demands, and they, but they must be taken into consideration. And I'm going to get into the next slides, you know, how that kind of language differs a little bit. Um, so, for example, a person could say, you know, if I become injured or suddenly fall ill, I would request all life-saving treatments available to me. So that's one way of phrasing it. I'm requesting the treatments. Um, another way of phrasing that would say, be if I became injured or suddenly ill, I would consent to all life-saving life treatment. So um, slightly different phrasing, um, but I think that it does uh, kind of change the way that we approach um, what we're asking for in an advanced healthcare directive. So I, I, I really uh, just appreciate the, this, this change in terminology. Uh, similar as before, living with dementia and I develop uh, cancer, I would request chemotherapy if it could extend my life. So we have a patient request, and in this case, the healthcare teams would, you know, take that into consideration and determine if that's sort of the appropriate outcome. Another way of looking at it would say, I would consent to chemotherapy. So that's saying, if this treatment is actually offered to the patient, would you, and available to the patient, would you or would you not consent to it? And in this case, the person could. Uh, and similar here, you know, if I'm reaching the end of life, I would request ventilation. Uh, has a very different kind of connotation than if I'm reaching the end of life, I would consent to ventilation. So uh, I think with the with the former, there's um, an idea and maybe uh, an idea of from patients or their families that a request is, is a demand that they should automatically get it, 
Whereas when we phrase things as consent, uh, it's it's really offering it if it is an option, you know, then we're seeking seeking consent afterwards. So they're slightly different um, and they're slightly different in how they're interpreted by people. But at the end of the day, uh, requests and consent is not the same as a demand. If somebody's asking for a certain treatment or, or would consent to a certain treatment, it's only based on availability. So they can be denied and you have the right um, to deny certain treatments if it's unavailable or unlikely to work, if it would cause more pain and suffering, if it's not an appropriate treatment. And the final decision lies with healthcare teams for uh, uh, knowing what a patient would like to receive. And the last thing um, that you'll look for in an advanced healthcare directive or that is included in an advanced healthcare directive is a designated healthcare representative. This person is named by the directive maker. You can't name yourself one um, on behalf of somebody else. The directive maker must name this individual in their advanced healthcare directive. It doesn't have to be a family member, although it can be. It can also be a friend, a neighbor, a colleague, you know, generally someone you trust, ideally. This person has to be over the age of 18. They also have to have capacity um, to agree to this and to, uh, to uh, uh, advocate on your behalf, but they do not have to prove capacity either. So I'll get into a little bit of that. They don't have to prove it, but they do have to have capacity. Um, Anybody who has barring orders, they're not, they're prevented from being a designated healthcare representative. And if they're in a paid kind of caring position, owner of a nursing home, an employee, uh, uh, and they're unrelated to the directive maker, they're not allowed to be uh, in this role as well. But for the most part, it could be um, almost anybody there. Okay. I see questions coming in. And just as a reminder, I'll answer them after uh, we stop the recording. Okay. So what can a designated healthcare representative do? They must always ensure compliance with the directive. So that's their primary role to make sure that, that whoever has made this uh, advanced healthcare directive, um, that their wishes and their, well, their preferences and their decisions are, are followed through. And they can give consent and refusal according to that directive following directly. And they may advise when that directive is unclear. So if the person, the language was a little bit unclear or uh, the treatment that they're being offered is uh, mostly similar to what they wrote down uh, in their document, but maybe slightly different, then they would advise on that, uh, on those situations. The directive maker may also be granted additional responsibilities. This has to be in the advanced healthcare directive at the time of its making. In Think Ahead, we have a simple box that you check to give the directive maker or the designated healthcare representative uh, uh, these additional responsibilities. And that would be to interpret and advise and give consent and refusal to treatments that are not included in the directive. So if, um, if, I give only the, if I never write down any refusals or requests, but I give in my designated healthcare uh, representative the right to interpret my wishes uh, based on my own known wills and preferences, then they are allowed to refuse and consent to tr all treatments um, based on what they know about uh, what I want. So I don't have to specify that within the directive. So they can have one or both of these options, depending on what an individual would like to give uh, to give to their designated healthcare representative. And you can also have an alternate designated healthcare representative, but they don't necessarily have to work together. Um, the designated healthcare representative would be turned to first and the alternate afterwards. So uh, dispelling some myths about the next of kin. Uh, there is no legal standing for what is considered next of kin. There is no hierarchy. Um, and certainly the uh, not having that clarity can cause quite a bit of stress and confusion at the end of life, especially uh, if, for example, there are two children of somebody who disagree on the type of treatment that that per patient should get. Um, so in the end, um, with no designated healthcare representative, healthcare teams make the final call on all treatments. That is not a change change from the ADMA. That's always been the case. Um, and so it's important uh, to remove um, and replace next of kin in your own uh, in your own places of work um, and and ideally replace it with 
a designated healthcare representative or emergency contacts and being clear about um, exactly what you are looking for and the and knowing the roles and responsibilities of those uh, kind of titles that you're giving people. Certainly some people who you're working with um, might not have capacity uh, to name a designated healthcare representative, which is why I would recommend putting in an emergency contacts there as well. Um, and hopefully with time, we move toward kind of this language of, of really naming who is the person to speak on your behalf for healthcare decisions. So once all of those pieces are done, it must be signed and witnessed, same time, same place, all together. The directive maker signs it to witnesses, uh, those witnesses, one of those witnesses must be outside of the immediate family. Um, anybody that you would consider family is considered family as well. There is a list on uh, within our documents and within, uh, within the DSS website and everything that, that explains who is considered family, but cousins, nephews, uh, they're, all, they're all family, uh, siblings, et cetera, and so on, are all considered family. Everybody has to, so they all sign it. And if anybody has been named as a designated or an alternate uh, healthcare representative, they also sign it at the same time. The role of the witness, uh, the witnesses are not required to read the documents. They're not required to approve of anything in there. They're just there to act and say, yes, it appears that whoever is making this document is making it of their own free will and that they have capacity to do so. Um, so hopefully they you know, in best case scenario, they are somebody who knows this individual well enough to judge that. But I will say, um, so, yeah, this says just what I said there before, attesting that they're making it, you know, voluntarily. Um, and I actually, I have another slide that's, uh, thought I had another slide right after this, which just says that, um, you know, according to what we can tell um, from the codes of practice, I see nothing that says that healthcare professionals cannot be witnesses. So it appears that healthcare professionals can be a witness, although they wouldn't necessarily be able to be a designated healthcare representative. Uh, med mental health and advanced healthcare directives, really, to be honest with you, there's not much difference between the two, but I do wanna address it. Um, can a healthcare, prof oh, well, there's my slide. So yeah, let's slip that in there, but. Healthcare professional can be a witness so far as we can tell. Um, can my patient have a directive for mental health? Yes, they can. Directives can be for physical or mental health. They can be both within the same one, or you can have two separate ones. Um, if they are admitted um, into a facility for mental health un and voluntarily, then their physical and their mental health decisions are fully legally binding. If they're admit, admitted into a mental health facility involuntarily, uh, then their physical health, uh, physical health advanced care directive is still binding as well. And um, that's, that's included even if the person is uh, involuntarily detained based on risk factors to others, still at least their physical advanced health care directive um, is fully legally binding. And so uh, I'm not an expert on, on mental health. And so I will, I'll direct you again back to the decision support service and the HSC for further guidance on that. And I know there's more legislation coming down the line as well around that. Once all of these pieces are done, it is the directive maker's responsibility to make their directive known and to share it with others. There is no register at the moment. Um, once there is a register, a document does not have to be registered to be valid. So uh, if a person comes into you with a, with a document after there's a register, it should still be checked for all its other things to make sure that it's a valid document, but it doesn't need to be uploaded there. But for the moment, the person making these documents must share them out with all sort of who need to know. I would recommend that copies be made to the designated healthcare representatives GPs, consultants, and sort of healthcare professionals that they interact with. So what does all of this mean in practice? This is what you're here for. I know this is the good stuff here. So does my patient have a valid advanced healthcare directive? How am I supposed to know? So I know that all of these steps aren't always easy to answer, and especially with there no, being no register. If you're able to, ask a patient. And ask a patient while they're well. Um, so ideally, you know, these patients, these documents get put into files uh, before they're needed. 
Um, if at all possible, ask the patient directly, ask any accompanying people if they have an advanced healthcare directive, uh, check their medical file and call their GP and document all your steps to do this. Obviously in an emergency situation, uh, this isn't always, uh, you know, going to be able to be done. And, and, and if you're not able to do all of these steps and find one, you're still protected. I'll get to that in a second. But in as many cases as possible, try and discern if a person has one of these documents. If they do, sorry, if you, you're not able to determine if they have an advanced healthcare directive, if you don't know if they have one, um, so the people coming along with them, you know, don't know the answer, then you still act as you normally would with life sustaining, life saving measures. If they have it somewhere, say they've left it on their coffee table at home, uh, but it's not with them, they or you can't access it, it's in uh, another hospital that you aren't able to get those files, or even sometimes I know in the same hospital, but not able to transfer files over, you are still protected uh, and and uh, act in life life saving measures. So you would kind of use that you use your normal um, pathways there as well. So. Even if one if one exists or one doesn't exist, but you don't have it in front of you, you're protected uh, to to use the normal measures that you would use uh, for treatment. You must have it in front of you. If you find out later that somebody does have an advanced healthcare directive, you are not liable. You should then follow the directive as it's after it's given to you. Um, but really, you know, all of this process is to say document all the steps that you took to discern if somebody has an advanced healthcare directive in an emergency situation. Obviously, that timeline is condensed and the, uh, the availability or, or the potential to do that is condensed as well. You're protected in those circumstances. So just document every step that you've taken. And if it's not made available to you, you're protected. Once you find out about one or, but really not just find out about it, once you're given one, shared one with you, then you take steps to follow the directive as, um, as you've been made aware. So if they've um, brought a document with them, an advanced healthcare directive with them, or uh, you have a copy on file, then you need to check what it contains. All of this is working in a good faith assumption. Um, so starting with that assumption that the document is valid. Assume that it was made with capacity. Assume that it was made without coercion. And if you do have any kind of doubt, you need to provide evidence for that. It's not the patient's responsibility to you to prove capacity. Um, when you're using these documents, the patient won't have capacity. So first of all, I suppose to take a step back is that um, we're returning to these documents once we've determined that a patient doesn't have capacity to make or express that decision in the moment. That could be due to an injury, but it could also be due to illness or mental incapacity of some sort. Um, but once you've determined that, you assume that the documents were made while the patient has capacity, and it's not their responsibility to prove otherwise. Checking the contents. Um, you know, I recommend actually starting by checking for a designated uh, healthcare representative and an alternate. The reason being is that you need to know if they if if they have to have signed something as well. So while you're checking if they've named anybody there, good time to kind of check what rights and responsibilities they were given by the directive maker, and then go ahead and check that all parties signed the documents uh, and that that all looks correct. So the directive maker, two witnesses, and um, the designated and or alternate uh, healthcare representatives. Whoever has been named in the document must sign the document. If that looks good, I would turn first to the refusals. So have they refused a specific treatment that's being offered right now? Then do not provide treatment. Or is the situation materially similar enough, even if small differences exist? That could be in language, um, or you know, maybe a patient not fully understanding all the complexity of how to phrase something. Um, but if it's similarly uh, uh, situationally uh, similar, then do not provide treatment. And you are protected. You are fully protected from criminal and civil liability by following any refusals in this advanced healthcare directive. When you're working in that good faith assumption that it was that it was. Uh, uh, made properly. Then you can con check their consent and refusals. So 
if it's not named in the refusals, have they consented to the specific treatment that's being offered right now? And take that into consideration. Uh, it, you know, again, is it similar enough? Um, even if small differences exist, take that into consideration. Uh, again, consent or requests uh, fall to the healthcare team to make that final decision. But if you know that they would consent to something, then you kind of you have a bit of um, of leeway to go ahead with it as well. But you might need additional guidance. If their treatment decision uh, is unclear, uh, maybe they've said they, they would want it in this situation, but, but didn't really clarify any others, um, or they phrased it uh, sort of funnily. Um, if their treatment isn't mentioned at all in the advanced healthcare directive, um, or the preference is not you know, quite similar enough, and you're not quite sure exactly what it is, what their known will and preference would be, then you uh, refer to others if you have the time about their known will and preference. So if the designated healthcare representative, ideally if they're right there with you, this is kind of best case scenario, and they're given that power. If they're given the power to refuse or consent to treatments that aren't defined, uh, uh, then you can refer to them and ask, you know, what should we do in this situation? If you have the time, you can always uh, refer back to a GP or a treating physician. And this is sort of the order that you would go in the designated healthcare representative, a GP or treating physician who may have known them for a similar treatment uh, or, uh, or, or would have had conversations with them about this. And then you can turn to kind of accompanying friends and family as well. And this is all to um, not to get, not uh, especially with accompanying friends and family, it's not to get consent from them. Again, they're not that named person, but to provide information on the patient's known will and preferences. So if something seems off, what should I do? I can't actually see the bottom of my slide here. Give me two seconds. Um, you have to seek and provide evidence. So you are required uh, to give evidence uh, provide evidence of why you shouldn't follow something. So uh, to clarify that, um, this is in the way, sorry. So if you think the patient was coerced, for example, or if they lacked capacity at the time of writing the directive, those might be two kind of primary concerns that people have. Something seems a little off about. In this case, you are required to provide evidence. Again, the patient doesn't need to prove uh, to prove that this document was made in good faith. So you have to discuss those concerns with the designated healthcare representative and those witnesses. Witnesses could be called upon. Their their information is collected in these documents um, uh, to get to get a bit more information about the time that this was being made and and how the patient was. Uh, you can also discuss with the patient's GP or with other physicians, treating physicians, review their medical file. So all of these are steps that you can take to provide evidence if you think a patient was coerced or lacked capacity. And you must you know, document, I can't stress this enough, document and keep records of, of everything you do in these steps. Because if you do decide uh, to invalidate the document, you need to be able to show why. And again, it's not on the patient to prove capacity or to prove uh, that they weren't coerced or anything like this. So generally speaking to that point, um, my hope is that most advanced healthcare directives will not be invalidated. Of course, sometimes they will, but they're not allowed to be invalidated for any of these reasons uh, under the never column. You know, disagreeing with a decision, uh, if they've made a bad decision, if a decision goes against your beliefs, uh, if there's a treatment, if they've refused all treatments, but there's a treatment they didn't know about, uh, none of those things are valid reasons to, uh, to invalidate a document. And the healthcare representative is always required to follow the directions of the health uh, directive. And so even if they are trying to change their mind, at, uh, they can't do that. They still have to follow the, the directions there. But with evidence, you can invalidate a document. Um, obviously, if some anybody who's coming in and you're using these documents will lack capacity now, so that's not a reason to invalidate their directive. Um, but if, again, if you weren't sure if they had capacity when they made it or you think they were coerced, then you have to provide that evidence. If you find come to know that their uh, designated healthcare representative is inappropriate, somebody paid to look after them uh, or in a paid paid role, paid position, or uh, it's somebody who there's a barring order against this person, they're not appropriate, uh, then that part of the directive is invalidated as well. Um, and I would, you'd be within your rights, I think, to um, invalidate the whole document. But I would look and see, does it seem 
like this is their known will and preferences and still do some of that due diligence follow up on on their refusals and consent. If it's not signed and witnessed properly, then you're absolutely within your rights uh, to uh, invalidate the document. Again, you know, see if there's anything there that you can use that would provide guidance, uh, but you're within your rights to, to do that. Um, but a, a big one is around changing your mind. So if, an, if the person making the directive has previously um, acted kind of in direct contrast to what they'd written down, then that could invalidate parts of that as well. And I'll get back to that. I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, a few common questions that I've heard, you know, if a patient has a DNA CPR in their directive, but we, on my site, you know, we still require a new form every four weeks or every time they're admitted and so on. Uh, so does that jive? The answer is a no. Uh, Where's my answer? There it is. Uh, you must update your paperwork to match the patient's directive. So once this healthcare directive is made, it's, it's a legally binding, a legally valid document, and they're not required to fill out additional paperwork or to work with you to complete additional paperwork. Uh, your paperwork must adapt to what the patient brings in, whether that's think ahead, whether that's a form the HSC puts out, whether that's following a template from the decision support service, or whether that's something that a, a person has kind of drafted on their own, uh, your paperwork has to update to match theirs. So if you adhere to their refusals, as I've said, I think I've said this a couple of times, but just to rephrase it again, uh, you are not criminally or civilly liable uh, by following their valid refusals. So if you follow their healthcare directive, you are protected. You do have to have it in hand. Um, you can't take it on, on a good word of a, of a close friend or of a spouse. That, oh, they did that, I promise you. But you, have, you do have to see it. And once you've seen it and you follow those directives, then you are protected. If I override their refusals, am I liable? And you might be, this would be in that gray area because you need to document all steps that you took to adhere to their refusals. You need to document why you invalidated their decision. So again, if that's, if you think somebody was coerced, if you think they didn't have capacity, um, or if there's some other uh, reason that you have uh, determined that it's uh, sort of an incorrect, um, uh, then you have to document all those reasons why you invalidated it, um, because this is, again, a legally valid document. If you override their request or consent, on the other hand, uh, you are not liable. So requests, giving consent, these are not legally binding decisions. If you document all the steps that you've taken, again, a lot of record keeping for this one, uh, document all the steps you took to adhere to it, or the reasons why you can't adhere to it, uh, you are protected. So requests and consent is not the same as refusals. But a person can always change their mind. As long as the person is able to make a decision and express that decision, they can change their mind. I had a question yesterday, kind of uh, using that example of going into surgery and saying, you know, if something happens to me in surgery, uh, you know, don't resuscitate me. But they said, well, what if they really don't understand the risks and this isn't a risky surgery? You know, uh, am I allowed to, to, to talk to them and explain that? And you, you are, you are allowed to talk and explain uh, uh, treatment options always. And a person is always allowed to uh, change their mind. I mean, they are allowed to make a bad decision um, or, or an unwise decision. They're allowed to take bad advice as well. But if you're there and you're saying, I don't know if you fully understand kind of uh, the, maybe the risk or or the consequences of, of the choice. And I just want to explain that again to you. And on and in that moment, they express and make a different choice, then that supersedes an advanced healthcare directive all the time. As long as a person can make and express a decision, then we're not even looking at the advanced healthcare directives anyway. But a person can also revoke an advanced healthcare directive with a simple written statement. They can write it out. You can write it on a piece of paper and sign it, and it's done. You don't need to have that one witnessed. You don't need to have that one uh, signed by anybody else. 
And again, as I said, if you act or uh, you know make a decision that's in direct contrast to what you what you wrote in in your documents, then that acts as sort of superseding that that previous refusal. So if, for example, similar to the example that I gave above, if I've written down, you know, uh, given a DNAR in my advanced healthcare directive for surgery, but then I make a decision, I say, you know what, actually I changed my mind. If something does happen to me in surgery, I would require, I would consent to that treatment, then that invalidates that piece of my advanced healthcare directive. But it only invalidates that piece. It doesn't invalidate the whole thing. There are a few resources I just want to make sure you're aware of. I, I, I'm fairly certain you all are, but just in case, the decision support service.ie has so many resources and vignettes on there in addition to the codes of practice. So I highly recommend that you look, especially if there are uh, specific scenarios that, um, that you have questions on. And you can always submit those to them as well, and they'll keep updating. They're looking, you know, always looking for. Um, for more case studies uh, to be able to kind of explore as well for other people. AssistedDecisionMaking.ie is the HSC website with a number of webinars and a link to the HSC land trainings as well. Uh, thinkahead.ie has our resources on this and we'll be continuing to update uh, this, especially with kind of easy to understand videos, uh, animated videos for, uh, for patients, for kind of not non-professionals as well. These, uh, you know, think ahead. This is just a, a you know, a quick, I, I'd be doing a bad job if I didn't give a quick promo to our program here, um, but you can uh, order or download for free uh, the forms from thinkahead.ie um, and everything and how to make a, a proper advanced healthcare directive is included in those forms. Those are fully up to date uh, with the uh, with the codes of practice. I think with the next printing, we'll, we'll change some of that wording to consent, but, um, but everything is, is completely valid, completely up to date. And I'm gonna open it up. I'm gonna go to the questions that are in the chat here after we stop the recording. But if there are questions or, uh, or comments or anything that comes up after today's lunch session, that's our phone number and that's my email address. Um, and so you're, you're very welcome to please uh, to give us a call or to give us an email with those as well. So with that, just give me two seconds while I stop recording. And thank you all for your time here. <laughs>